Good morning, everybody, and happy Sabbath. I am so glad that you are here with us today. We've had snow, we've had cold, we've had wind. I actually got stuck in a snowdrift Sabbath evening. But uh, we're all okay, everything is safe, and I'm so happy that you have decided to join us here on this beautiful Sabbath day. If we could, could we all bow our heads for a word of prayer as we begin? Our dear, kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We have to be able to open up the scriptures this morning and take a second look, maybe a third or fourth look, at this very important story from early in your ministry here on earth. And so we ask a blessing and that the hearts will be open to this blessing and that you will send your Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and understanding in these spiritual things that we're going to be talking about today. And I ask that the words that I speak be your words and not my words. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading comes today from the book of John, John chapter 3, verse 3. I've already got it up on the screen for you. John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That comes from John chapter 3, verse 3. Nicodemus, is, or this story has always had special meaning to me um, for several reasons. One, I think this story applies to myself to a certain degree, in fact, very much so. It was a special story to my mom, and it was a special story that we shared back and forth amongst each other in a very personal and, and intimate way. And it was a, so this story has always had great meaning to me. But I'm going to start off this sermon by giving a little parable here. And he spake unto them a parable, saying, Two medical students went off to school to study medicine. It's a good thing. I like it when people are able to do that because it means that we're going to have people to take care of us when we're not healthy. One of the first things, though, that these med students were introduced to was the anatomy lab. But there was something different. There was a heavy silence in the anatomy lab, and it was kind of cold, and things were, well, pardon the pun, really dead there. Based on these meds, but these med students were anxious to make good showing, make a good sewing, so they analyzed the situation. They noticed a good deal of unity within the lab. There didn't seem to be any fighting going on. No one was vying for the highest place. They were all at or in the same position. As the med students considered the situation, they became convinced that what these patients needed was improved health. Therefore, they tried to introduce the patients to a new diet, but nobody seemed to have an appetite. They told the patients about the benefits of exercise, but no one seemed interested. These students determined that there must be an even deeper problem. They wondered if the problem was a lack of fellowship. But that turned out to be a dead-end street once again, pardon the pun. The patients refused to be sociable. They tried to develop a statement of mission, but it was ignored. They considered the lack of resources and took up an offering, but nobody gave. In the end, and to their dismay, the med students discovered people in the lab all had a common problem. They were not breathing. In my late teens, I guess it would have been early 20s, right in that range, I developed a friendship with a girl by the name of Lori. She was a fun, attractive girl, and it was great being around her and her friends, and my friends and her friends kind of joined in together, and we had an absolutely great time together. 
over the length of time our friend suggested that Lori and I should date, but it never seemed quite right. We were just good friends that enjoyed hanging out together. We would watch TV together. We would go bowling together with everybody else, and we just had a really nice time together. But there was a few times, because of the peer pressure, that we did go out on an actual date. But I must admit, it just seemed awkward, not only to me, but to her as well. And we decided that this wasn't for us, but yet we remained good friends. About a year later, maybe just slightly more, I started dating my wife. There was no awkwardness. The chemistry just seemed to be there. It was like we were the perfect fit. Unlike Lori, we didn't try to make it happen. It just happened naturally. We just clicked. It was easy. And 38 years later, it still naturally fit together. Or we still naturally fit together. The difference between those two relationships was a click that transformed the second into love. Breathless cadavers and self-willed romances have something in common with the message that Jesus gave to Nicodemus. You remember Nicodemus. He's the Pharisee that came to Jesus in the dark. And since John's book is about the contrast between light and darkness, John wanted us to see the condition of Nicodemus. Yes, Nicodemus did come to Jesus in the dark of the night, but darkness was also in the heart of Nicodemus. Jesus and Nicodemus were talking about, of all things, the second birth. Jesus said that it was necessary to have the second birth before anyone could see the kingdom of heaven. So Nicodemus asked an important question. It's one that we should all be asking. Nicodemus asks it, however, sarcastically. Nevertheless, it is an important question. And that question is, how does this second birth happen. The subject of conversion is critical, but it is also problematic because you cannot convert yourself. You cannot do the work necessary to make another, to make you into another person. Con conversion is a miracle but most of us think we can do it by ourselves. Then if someone tells you that you need to be converted and you're not converted, what will you do about it? You and I have no more power to transform ourselves than we can raise the dead. Can you make yourself fall in love with Jesus? Can you make yourself fall in love with Jesus by an act of your will? Can you say, I'm going to fall in love with Jesus? Does it make me fall in love with him any more than I could make myself fall in love with Lori? Can I simply say, I'm going to fall in love with Jesus? Will I be will I appreciate him and be filled with warm thoughts and earnest devotion? Is this how it all works? Is there anything that I can do? Or did Jesus give us any clues when he was speaking with Nicodemus? Let's briefly look back at the story. Our pre-story to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a member of the Sanhedrin, you became a member of the Sanhedrin of Pharisees if you were a highly educated individual. In John chapter 2, we see that Jesus cleansed the temple. Nicodemus intently watched. He saw what happened after the merchants and the others had been thrown out of the temple. 
He saw the crowds that came to Jesus both for healing and for comfort. Since the time of Nicodemus, since that time, Nicodemus had been searching the scriptures, trying to find out more about the predicted work of the Messiah. Nicodemus was certainly convinced that there was something special about Jesus, and there must be some link between him and the prophecies regarding the Messiah. By studying the Messiah, he began to develop a relationship with Jesus even before coming to Jesus in the darkness. When we, he finally met Jesus, Nicodemus started by offering him a, a compliment as we see, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher from God. Nicodemus was trying to pave the way for religious discussion. When I look at the story of Nicodemus, it scares me, for it begs me to ask a very personal question. Is it possible for me to fool myself into thinking I'm a Christian because I can talk for a long time about spiritual things? Did you catch that? Let me repeat it one more time, just so we're on the same page. Is it possible for possible for me to fool myself into thinking I am a Christian because I can talk for a long time about scriptural things. Just because I have spent a lot of time studying and can carry on a conversation regarding scriptural things doesn't make me a Christian. But studying and telling others about Christ is indeed important. Nicodemus is highly educated religious leader who believes that Jesus is unique and asks to have a conversation. Jesus looks at Nicodemus and penetrates his thoughts, then something that must says something that must have startled Nicodemus, this highly educated Pharisee. Jesus says, Jesus says, I'm going to tell you the truth. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. For years, I assumed this is what Jesus meant. Unless you have a conversion experience, you can't go to heaven. See John chapter 3, verse 3. Yet a careful reading indicates something totally different. Nicodemus asks if they can talk about spiritual things. Jesus instantly replies that you cannot even see spiritual things unless you have a rebirth or conversion experience. Until then, they won't even register in your mind. We can talk about them because you, we can't talk about them, Jesus is saying, because you're not going to grasp them. You don't have a clue. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned, and spiritual discernment only happens to people who have converted hearts, a rebirth experience. We've all been to the eye doctor. They show us these panels of multicolored boxes embedded with numbers, and you're supposed to be able to pick out the number. If you're not colorblind, you can always see the number perfectly, but if you're colorblind, you may miss seeing a number that's in those colored boxes. And if it's, if it's red, blue, yellow, or green, each one of those n colors has a number embedded somewhere into there. I never knew I was colorblind until I played racquetball. If the ball was blue, I had no trouble. But sometimes I had difficulty seeing if the ball was green. It threw my depth perception off. 
Yes, I can see green grass and I can see green leaves. If the walls are painted a shade of green, I might see the bluer shades easier than the green shades. My case of colorblindness, you see, is relatively mild compared to some. But suppose you cannot see the color red. Others around you point out the beautiful red-colored roses. in the rose garden, but you can't see them. Therefore, you must trust others with the fact that there are red roses in the garden. That is, the pri that is precisely the problem we have with unconverted hearts. We know roses are in the rose garden, and they are red, but we can't see them. Then if you are studying the scriptures and you can't see it, it doesn't, you, and you can't see it, don't always understand it, you're not alone. There are lots of people that way. So don't beat yourself up about it. We are all like the blind man who asked Jesus to open their eyes. The story that we see in Matthew chapter 20, verses 30 through 34. You were born spiritually unable to see, seeing is a miracle given to us from heaven. Nicodemus, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is saying, until you are born again. Nicodemus had come to talk theology, to talk about religious things. Jesus was telling him something we all need to understand. It's not about theoretical knowledge. It's not about theology. You need as much or what you are needing is spiritual regeneration. You don't need to have your curiosity satisfied. You need to have a new heart. You must receive new life from above before you can appreciate the heavenly things. Jesus is saying, until, until this change takes place, making all things new, it will result in no saving good for us to discuss my story or mission. Did you catch what I just said? Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, unless this change, this rebirth takes place, making all things new, it will result in no saving good for us to have a discussion regarding my story, Jesus' story, and his mission, to phrase it another way. For Nicodemus, and for you and I, it's a hard pill to swallow. Nicodemus is highly educated, denominationally sound, multi-generational, church-going member and leader. Nicodemus had heard John the baptizer preach, but he felt no conviction. He lived life to the letter of the law, at least on the outside. He wouldn't think of doing anything wrong. He is noted for his generosity, paid a faithful tithe, and gave both of his time and op money liberally to the support of the church. Yet, Nicodemus was struggling because he did not want to think he could be missing something. He was doing all he knew in order to have it right and thus be saved. To be told that something was missing didn't feel good was devastating to him. But Jesus said, as we see, unless a man is born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God, of heaven. Nicodemus asks the question that we all need to ask, how can a man be born when he is old? As we see in John chapter 3, verse 4. We, like Nicodemus, have trouble wrapping our heads around this idea. 
Jesus' response to Nicodemus is found in verse 5. Unless a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. We as humans love to have control over things. Oh, trust me, we love control over things. We love to exercise the dominion over those around us and the things we become involved in. It has been our human nature since the introduction of sin. And here Jesus is telling Nicodemus, sorry Nicodemus, this is one aspect of your life that you don't have any control over. Why do we not have any control over this? Because it is a spirit thing. It's supernatural. Nicodemus, Nicodemus I am telling you this. Not just you, not just you, but all of us that are here today. Let me start that over because I think I'm stating it incorrectly and I want to make sure I'm right. Nicodemus, I'm telling you, this is not you and me theorizing or making a matter of theology. Jesus didn't make it about winning some point in a debate. He broke it down as absolutely simply as possible. Nicodemus, you know the wind blows. We in Wyoming know the wind blows. Look at the trees. Well, if we had trees, we could look at the trees and see the result. It was snowing earlier. We can see the result of the, of the wind in the fact that the snow is blowing. When the wind blows, you can't see the wind, but you can see the effect of the wind. That's the way it is with the Spirit. You can't see the Spirit, but when He does His work in your heart, you will then be able to see the effect. You will understand there will be a difference. It will be your experience, but the Spirit will be the one causing it. If you can say that it's the Spirit that gives birth, it isn't about anything that you can do. Yes, you and I can do. Would you feel better by hearing this and putting yourself in Nicodemus's shoes? I can almost hear Nicodemus saying, well, okay, then I came here to talk about spiritual things and you can't tell, te and you tell me I can't see them or understand them unless I'm born again. Jesus, is there anything I can do to place myself in a favorable position, a place where I'm more receptive to the Spirit to do whatever it is you say to me to do? Tongue twister there, isn't it? We see this in John chapter 3, verse 9. That's the essence of the conversation that's taking place. Once again, Nicodemus is trying to control the situation. Jesus says, Nicodemus, Nicodemus, do you remember the snake? This statement is Jesus' benchmark statement on the subject of conversion. Here Jesus answers to Nicodemus' question about whether we can do anything to avail ourselves of the spiritual, of the Spirit's work. Nicodemus, do you remember the snake? It's the story found in Numbers chapter 21, verses 7 through 9. The story of the bronze serpent that affected a cure. Do you remember? Do you remember that the people were dying from snake bites? As a result, Moses was instructed to put a serpent on a pole. Do you remember that, Nicodemus? What happened after that? Let's look at the story. So let's turn to Numbers chapter 21, verses 7 through 9. Numbers chapter 7, verses 7 through 9. 
Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, and so it was if a, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he did what? That's right. He lived. What was the what were the, what was the instruction to the people? Come on, let's let's answer this question. What was the instructions to the people of Israel given to from God to Moses to give to the people? Look at the uplifted serpent. What happened when they looked at the uplifted serpent? They were healed. I haven't seen one, but I understand Wyoming has rattlesnakes and suppose you are bitten by one. You go to the emergency room to get the anti-venom. The doctor, hearing of your condition, comes to the, to, to the gurney where you're laying and says, look at the picture of the rattlesnake in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Just stare it for a few minutes and you'll be fine. We would all think that the doctor was nuts, wouldn't we? You would want to get out of there as fast as you can to go to a real hospital and a real doctor, wouldn't you? What's happening in Numbers 21? I'm asking a question here. What's happening in Numbers chapter 21? What is happening? It is something supernatural. It didn't matter if you had been playing with the snakes when you got bit. If you, if you looked, you lived. It didn't matter if you had been bitten once before and were healed. Then got better again and came back to the bronze serpent. No, if you looked again, you were healed again. Regardless of how many times you have been bitten, it doesn't matter. If you deliberately choose to be bitten or playing with the snakes when you are bitten or are being bitten was simply an accident, if you look at the bronze snake, you are healed. There was life in a look. There was life in looking at the bronze snake. Did you do anything? No, you didn't do anything except look. The healing happened miraculously. It was supernatural. And the miracle happened only to the people who did what? They looked. Therefore, if you don't look, you die. Nicodemus asked if there was anything he could do. Jesus responded by saying yes. Jesus said, if you look my direction, lift me up, the Spirit's work happens in your heart, and, I will, and you will experience a new birth. I'm sorry, it's that simple. You don't have to wait for the preacher to lift up Jesus. You can do that yourself. How often do you do that? Once in a lifetime? Maybe yearly? How about monthly? My friends, this is important. We can do this daily. We need to do this daily. As much as some of us would like to think so, the soul is not enlightened by proof texts. Yep, that's what I said. That's what I said. The soul is not enlightened with proof texts. 
discussions, debate, or arguments over the scriptures. It is only enlightened by looking at Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 31, or verse 32, excuse me. John chapter 12, verse 32. I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will, what's the text say? Draw all people to myself. Jesus is saying, if you look my direction, if you lift me up, the Spirit's work, the Spirit's work happens in your heart and you will experience new birth. Today, what each of us should want is new birth. Yet I can't make it happen. You can't make it happen. I cannot soften and subdue my own heart. But I understand that if I look toward Jesus, look at Jesus, there is something that the Spirit will do for me that I can't do for myself. Therefore, I am going to and am asking you to look toward Jesus. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 31 puts it this way. I die daily. And daily, you and I need to look to Jesus. Only by looking to Jesus can we be healed from the serpent's venomous bite. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Our dear, kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we have come before you this morning trying to control our own destiny and trying to control our own hearts and trying to control things around us. But you, through the story of Nicodemus, make it all, break it down so simply. It's not an item that we can control. It's only something that can be changed from the inside out. When we look to Jesus, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit changes us from the inside out. May we all have the faith to understand that it is only through you that this process can happen. You are both the author and the finisher of our faith, and therefore we ask you to finish our faith and to recreate in us your likeness, not because of anything that we have done, but because of what you have done for us. And we ask this in your Son's holy and precious name. Amen.